On today's Locked on Jayhawks, we take a look at KU's path through the Big 12 tournament, possible Big 12 quarterfinal preview against, I guess, one of West Virginia or Texas Tech on today's show. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. You can hear me as well on Rock Chalk Sports Talk Monday through Friday from 3 to 6 on KLWN in Lawrence. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get any of your podcasts, and you can also find us on YouTube. On today's edition of Locked on Jayhawks, we're going to be taking a look at the Big 12 tournament bracket, the path ahead for KU to try to win the Big 12 tournament, and what that could potentially mean for this team. We'll also get into a little bit of a preview of if Kansas plays West Virginia or if Kansas plays Texas Tech in the Big 12 quarterfinal. Um, this will probably be, I don't know, maybe we'll do, do a show like on Thursday night. Otherwise, probably next show wouldn't be till Friday morning discussing whatever happens there. But uh, things are fluid. Things just could get a little crazy here in the next couple of days. Um, so let's take a look at the Big 12 bracket. Here it is here if you're watching with us on YouTube. Kansas getting the one seed. They're going to play the winner of West Virginia and Texas Tech in the 8-9 matchup. That game happens on Wednesday night. Oklahoma State, Oklahoma also in a Wednesday night matchup. Uh, The other end of the board looks a little bit easier. And, And I think now that I'm looking at this, is this correct? Is Iowa State the five seed i could have sworn it was baylor uh versus versus uh tcu anyway i'll I'll double check on that this is directly from the big 12's website so that would actually be funny if they messed this up nonetheless uh the path for the big 12 starts in the big 12 quarterfinals yeah it is iowa state baylor i don't know why i thought baylor was playing tcu so i've been wrong this whole time glad i pulled this up here uh nonetheless baylor takes on iowa state and uh that i think becomes interesting for a semifinal matchup but um for KU, you're looking at West Virginia Tech, and I think if you're just viewing this from, from two lenses, you can view this from the lens of what's the easiest path for KU. You can view it from the lens of what is their best path to strengthening their resume headed into the NCAA turn, tournament trying to get the number one overall seed. Well, you can, for the easiest path, probably lean Texas Tech beating West Virginia without their head coach, Mark Adams, and... I know both games with Tech were close, but like in the second game, it wasn't a game that, like it was a game that was close because KU couldn't hit an open shot. West Virginia in the second game, when once they got Kedrian Johnson, the really good point guard back, they just almost like straight up beat you. So I think if you're looking for an easier matchup, you root for Tech there. Uh, I think you probably root for Iowa State, but again, you know, Iowa State beat you by a billion points. Um, I just I, I view Baylor's guards in a tournament setting like this as being very scary to play against. So I'd probably lean that. And then in the final, like, oh, you just say, well, whoever's the lowest seed remaining. But uh, I think ideally of the the top three teams there on the bottom side of the bracket with Texas, K-State and TCU, that you would expect one of those three to be in there. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe TCU, maybe. Uh, but I don't know. Texas, I, I don't think there's a right answer there on, on the bottom side of the bracket. Um, I do think when you look at KU's path, though, it's, you know, a a little bit more difficult than probably I would even say Texas path as as the two seed. But that's okay because it does present you with opportunities to get the number one overall seed. And if that's the way you want to go, you root for West Virginia to beat Texas Tech because West Virginia is ranked, I think, as of this morning, 25th in the net rankings. Well, top 50 on neutral court is a quad one win but you also want west virginia to stay in the top 30 because top 30 at home is a quad one win so for for that win that you beat them at home to stay quad one you need them to stay in the top 30 well beat texas tech and you know if they play you they probably wouldn't drop out at that point so that would be beneficial to you because you could get another quad win out of it quad one win out of it it would also be beneficial to the conference and therefore you because 
for West Virginia, they probably need to win this game to be in the NCAA tournament. But if they do win the game, they're probably in good shape to make the NCAA tournament. And then that would look good for KU because it's another tournament team that you've beaten a couple times. And also it would just be good for the Big 12. Um, so I think that's what you're rooting for there. Uh, either Baylor or Iowa State would be a quad one win on a neutral court. So you wouldn't have to worry about that in the semifinals. And then obviously in the final, you would just assume that it would be a quad one opportunity as well. Basically, that means that if you're Kansas and West Virginia wins, you, you'd have three possible quad one chances. And you look at Houston, like their schedule, they're probably going to have like maybe one quad one chance in the AAC tournament. So they already have that massive lead in quad one wins over Houston. You could expand it even more with Alabama. Um, I don't know. That kind of depends on which teams they play in the SEC tournament, but there's a real chance that they could only get like two quad one wins out of it. So you could expand your lead on Alabama. That is if you kind of win out, which just adds to the idea that if KU can make it through this path unscathed, that there's a good chance they're going to get the number one overall seed. We had Graham Doran on our show yesterday with Rock Chalk Sports Talk, who does bracketology work, and he was talking about how uh, there's actually some scuttlebutt going around that that Houston, if they get the number one overall and they get to pick their region, they might actually pick the West region, which would certainly be interesting. But if Houston got, let's say Alabama got the number one overall and they picked the South, and then Houston got the two, no longer does it apply where Houston's preference gets sent to them. At that point, the NCAA tournament committee just picks for them. And then it could be um, that they get put in the Midwest and then Kansas gets to the West or the East. So uh, things kind of become interesting here based on what happens in the Big 12 tournament as well as those other two tournaments. But yeah, I, I, I think Baylor's the team that scares me the most here in this Big 12 tournament bracket just because, you know, they're a team that I'm worried about if you pick them deep in the NCAA tournament, because a lot of times we've seen teams who have elite offenses, which Baylor has, but have crummy defenses, which Baylor has get upset early in NCAA tournaments. Um, There's actually a couple teams like that this year, like Baylor, Gonzaga. And there's a little bit of a worry for me that they're going to lose in the first weekend because of that. But how often have we seen in big 12 tournament settings, those teams with really good offense that maybe don't have the best defenses run through the big 12 tournament. I mean, a lot of times it's just been Iowa State in past years. Like, that's the one that you kind of point to. But even that 2012 Missouri team, who same kind of case as Baylor, elite offense, not good defense. They lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament, but they won the Big 12 tournament. So I I almost feel like in these settings, that offense kind of, it gives you a little bit more. Now, obviously, for Iowa State, they're going to have kind of a home court advantage over Baylor. They travel so well to this event. So if you get Iowa State, Kansas in the semifinals, then it's going to be a fun 50-50 kind of crowd split. If you get Baylor, you'll have more of the crowd, but Baylor has those explosive guards. So I I think I would prefer to play Iowa State, honestly, but you could convince me that's bad too because you barely beat them at home and you lost by 100 points on the road to them and they would have good fan attendance. So I think either way, you're looking at a difficult path, but we knew that with the Big 12 tournament. Honestly, Baylor's kind of the one that that I would want to avoid there, but that's just personally me. Uh, rooting for West Virginia because it would be a quad one opportunity, even though it would be a more difficult quarterfinal game for Kansas on Thursday. Let's get into a uh, possible preview, depending who Kansas plays in the um, Big 12 quarterfinals with either Texas Tech or West Virginia in just a second in here first this episode of locked on jays is brought to you by fanduel sportsbook the midway point of the nba season is here now is the perfect time to download fanduel america's number one rated sportsbook new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win just download the fanduel sportsbook app it's safe secure super easy to use then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scores and threes drained you can bet on the big 12 tournament right now uh i kind of like the value bet of taking tcu at up over 400 4 to 1 kind of like kansas state at 2 at 9 to 1 i know you're you're basically cutting it off because whoever wins that game or whoever loses that game i should say is out but I don't know. I think whoever wins that game, I kind of think they're going to beat Texas. Maybe just me. Uh, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at bigger payout with same game parlay. Don't miss your chance to get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 
talk game previews for West Virginia or Tech. So if it's West Virginia, West Virginia right now sits at 18 and 13 on the season. At that point, they would be 19 and 13. Uh, metric sites love West Virginia. They're ranked 25th in the net. They're ranked 17th in Ken Palm. And since Kedrian Johnson has gotten back, they have really ascended even more. Had a lot of close losses this season. And now they've won three of their last four games, including against Iowa State and Kansas State over the last two. One of them on the road at Iowa State. Like those are really impressive wins. But yeah, Kedrian Johnson just changes this team at the point guard position. Joe Toussaint now moves to kind of the backup point guard, which He's been a solid facilitating point guard, but um, the fact that you can now have him as a backup point guard is really good. And Johnson has been, when he's played, one of the better point guards in the Big 12. Eric Stevenson, third team all Big 12. He can really fill it up in a hurry. You have Emmett Matthews on the wing. Trey Mitchell has done really well against Kansas in his career. And then kind of the, the size of Jimmy Bell and James Oconquo in the middle, unless they're playing small with, with Trey Mitchell. As far as what West Virginia does well, uh, they were a, the fourth best offense in the Big 12. Bob Huggins got himself a team that can shoot. Um, they finished sixth in three point percentage, but we've seen games where they've really gone off, off above that. Number one in offensive rebound rate. So if you play West Virginia, you have to come ready with your lunch pail, ready to go on the glass. They're number three in defensive rebound rate. You have to be ready for a physical game, you have to be ready to get on the glass. Um, defensively, they haven't been great. And we saw that both games, like Grady Dick went off in both games, and maybe. That's the best uh, medicine for Grady Dick to get out of this little rut over these past two games to play a West Virginia team that he played well against um, in kind of both matchups. Although uh, the more recent one wasn't as good, I believe, as the first one. But um, yeah, I mean, that that could be a good thing for for him to kind of get out of it in the second game. He ended up with 16 points. He went five, eight from three. First game, he had four threes, two down in uh, Morgantown. So that could be a, a possible good thing there. If you are Kansas taking on West Virginia, I think Kansas took on West Virginia last year in the Big 12 quarterfinals and you had the Bob Huggins ejection game. That was kind of funny. But overall, West Virginia is 15th in the country in offensive efficiency. They are 53rd in the country in defensive efficiency. They play at a bit of a faster pace, which I always like to, to KU's liking because they want to get out in transition and they're better when they get in transition. Defensively, they do a good job forcing steals 49th in the country. So maximizing possessions, doing a good job limiting their offensive rebounds, putting turnovers. That's the name of the game whenever you play against West Virginia. Now, as far as if they play Texas Tech, which Texas Tech is 16 and 15 on the season. So if you played them, they'd be 17 and 15. At that point, Tech lost at home to West Virginia, 76 to 61. Then they won in Morgantown, 78, 72. So the two teams have split the series and Tech won the more recent one in Morgantown. So I, I don't know that that gives you one way or another with with who's going to kind of have the edge here. Um, but Tech is going to come out if you play them. You'll see that that backcourt of Pop Isaacs, Davion Harmon. Harmon was pretty quiet in Lubbock and Isaacs went off. But then in Lawrence, Harmon kind of went off and Isaacs was very quiet. Uh, you have Jalen Tyson on the wing. Kevin O'Banner uh, kind of really struggled with his three-point shot, but he was so good against KU in uh, Lubbock. And then you have, I, I don't know the status of Daniel Bacho this week, but Fardaz Amak was really good. He had 18 rebounds and I think 14 points against you when you played in Lawrence. Really dominated the boards and controlled that for uh, Texas Tech win that was the case. They are 60th in offensive efficiency. They are 56th in defensive efficiency. Conference only numbers. Tech is eighth in both. Um, they've kind of dropped off. They uh, have not been great at shooting the ball in conference only games. They've turned it over way too much, but they've been a really good offensive rebounding team. It's not as good as what West Virginia has been, but that again becomes a key. Can you limit their offensive rebounding? I think they had 10 of them when they played you in Allen Fieldhouse about a week ago, and you had. Uh, just I want to say four of them. They're just ninth in defensive rebounding rate in the Big 12. So that part was a little uncharacteristic about the matchup that was played in Allen Fieldhouse. If you hold them to 10 offensive rebounds again, that's not like a terrible number. You should be able to get more offensive rebounds on your own end of things than what you had in, in the first meeting there. Um, but defensively, the, the thing they do really well, they defend hard without fouling. They um, have maybe gotten a little bit lucky from the three-point line because they're giving up a lot of three-point attempts, but they're third in three-point percentage. So I don't know, might be a little bit of luck there, but they're just ninth in two-point defense. So even though Kansas had a slog offensively last time they played Texas Tech, 
I wouldn't read too much into it. Remember how many open shots they missed, especially from three in that game, that if you play them again, you feel like you're going to have a bit of a reversion to the mean and you're going to be okay there. But yeah, this is not one of those classic Texas Tech defenses we remember from past seasons to where um, they've just been one of the best defenses in the country. Like, okay, for instance, so 2022, Tech had the number one defense. Year before that, 18th. Year before that, ninth. Year before that, first. Year before that, fourth. This year, they're 56th. So the defense has dropped off. There there still are you know, certain traits that you like about them and, and certain things that because of that past history, you're always concerned about when you play them, but um, they have not been like an elite defense or anything. And, and actually, West Virginia has been a slightly better defense while having a much more dangerous offense. So again, the Tech matchup is the easier matchup for Kansas to win. The West Virginia matchup is the better matchup for KU's resume. You pick which one you would like them to have, but uh, certainly... It would be interesting. I, I will throw this stat out there, and I hope that it doesn't end up occurring. No team has won the national championship that has lost in the quarterfinal round or earlier of their conference tournament. So every national champion since 2002, I should say. I'm sorry. I should probably clarify that. Since 2002, every national champion has at least been to their conference semifinals or further. And... I don't know. Maybe there's nothing to it. Maybe that's one of those things where it is till it isn't. Obviously, if you're a good team, more times than not, you're going to make it to at least your conference semifinals. So the amount of teams that end up being really good or the amount of good teams that lose in their quarterfinals is a smaller sample size to where if we're only going back to 2002, 20 years of data, it's going to be harder for one of those teams to win, right? Those numbers are till they aren't, but Maybe it also speaks a little bit of something of maybe you're not playing your best ball headed into the NCAA tournament. There is going to be a lot of more pressure, I think, on KU to win this game and perform well when you look at how they did in their most recent outing against Texas. All right, let's get on to our matchups of the game, depending if it's West Virginia or if it's Texas Tech here with Locked on Jayhawks. So if the matchup is West Virginia, I, I think you immediately look back to the Jalen Wilson versus Trey Mitchell matchup between uh, the two teams. Trey Mitchell was awesome in the game in Lawrence. He uh, played pretty well, too, in the game in, in Morgantown, but they lost by 14 points and didn't really have a, a chance to, I guess, super impact things. Um, but yeah, in the, the game in Lawrence, he ended up with 20 points. He was 8 of 12 from the floor. He also had 7 rebounds, 2 assists. West Virginia just couldn't get that last shot off. Kedrian Johnson was really good with 15 points. That's going to be a great matchup with him and Dewan Harris. You heard from Bill Self in the post game. That's our other matchup here. Kedrian Johnson, Dewan Harris. That Johnson really took KU out of a lot of what they wanted to do offensively. That he was tipping a lot of passes or cutting off passes and angles that would start off the offense. That he was super impactful on the defensive end of the ball in addition to his speed and what he could do offensively. Um, then you have Dewan Harris who was doing the same thing. Dewan had a handful of steals. I think he officially ended up with six. Yeah, six steals, which was a career high for him against West Virginia, which he was basically taking West Virginia out of their offense. So you have those two point guards going up against each other, uh, playing at a super high level. I, I wonder if you'd see KU approach it as, hey, Dewan's just going to stick on Johnson. We're going to stick Kevin McCuller on Eric Stevenson and be done with it. And then maybe the other guys can switch. But that would be kind of the matchups there. So those are the two that stick out to me uh, from a team aspect. It's how KU does on the glass. Like West Virginia is going to get offensive rebounds. They just are. That's the strength of their game. But can you limit them to a number between 9 and 12? And can you hold down your turnovers to where you're at like 12 or below? Those are numbers that you feel comfortable in that you can win the game if that is the case. If it's Texas Tech, Matchups of the game for that one. Jalen Wilson versus Kevin O'Banner. Those are the two best players on each team. They play the same position at kind of the four, who both guys that can stretch it out a little bit. O'Banner was good in one matchup, not good in the other. Uh, Jalen Wilson was was very good in both matchups, especially the one over in Lubbock. But I, I think uh, maybe the most interesting matchup to me is KU versus Fardaz Amak, whether that's with KJ down low, mostly KJ, or Ernest Uday, because Amak... He struggled shooting the ball in the first half, but then he kind of grinded through, got it going in the second half, and he ended up with 18 rebounds and a double-double and was really a problem for you. Uh, a Texas Tech team that is ninth in Big 12-only play in defensive rebounding rate, which, yes, AMAC is a good defensive rebounder, and he hasn't always been there this season. 
to where the number is better when he's playing for them. But clearly, this is not a great defensive rebounding team. They they completely cut you down with the amount of offensive rebounds that you got in that game. And it was mostly AMAC just swallowing up like every possible uh, rebound chance that you had there. And so can Kansas be more effective with the offensive rebounding side of things than just the four they had in the game in Lawrence? KJ has been a pretty good offensive rebounder. Can he get more? Grady Dick's been pretty good at it. Kevin McCuller, uh, Jalen's more of a defensive rebounder. You have guys that have been pretty good at this for Kansas to where that's the kind of team matchup I'm most curious on. How do you deal with the the AMAC rebound, rebounding and just him down low because he started to figure some stuff out in the second half of the games? And then just trying to avoid one of those two guards with Isaacs or Harmon going off. Those would be kind of the matchups that I'm looking at for uh, either end of the spectrum. If you get the West Virginia matchup, you have the Self versus Huggins. If you get Tech, you get an interim coach taking on Bill Self. So those are interesting matchups. Uh, I think to point out as well. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. We might be back for a Thursday episode, like I said, uh, depending on how things go. If not, we'll be back Friday to, to recap whatever happens on Thursday and possibly look ahead to Friday if they win the game. This has been Locked on Jayhawks. You can hit me up at D Johnson Radio on Twitter, wherever we you get any of your podcasts. You can also hit us up on YouTube. Have a good rest of your day. Later.